thing and, and I'll get back on track. Uh, my name is Justin Revelstoke. Um, I'm giving a talk on brewing, brewing with data science and machine learning. Uh, these slides are available at this bit.ly short link, or you can scan that QR code to get there as well. Um, if you don't get it, it'll be on the last slide too. So a bit about me, I've been brewing since 01. Um, I'm a certified BJCP judge. Um, doesn't mean I like good beer. I'm a guild member. I am a Western graduate, um, but not for computer science. What, what, what's BJCP? Um, so it's the official organization that comes up with all the guidelines for each beer style. Oh, okay. So they're the ones that say red has to be this color and this IBU. And okay. yeah, if you want to talk about getting into that, I can I can talk with you after. I'm a software engineer here in Bellingham at Emergency Reporting. I instruct here at BTC on occasion. Um, father, biker, maker, sometimes all three at the same time. Um, these are my brewing credentials. So on the left there, that is called a pellicle, and that's a bacterial mat that forms when you're souring a beer. So if you're making like a Berliner Weiss or a Lambic, it, uh, stepping on cords, um, it'll form that mat like, like you get on kombucha, and that'll sour it before you actually boil it on the hops. And then over here I have... I have four beers going at the same time next to the space heater, bundled up for winter. All right, so I guess we should start with what is machine learning, because I'm assuming not everyone here knows exactly, exactly what that entails. Um, and it's not magic, it's, it's just math. It, math and magic, maybe. Um, and. Uh, not even complicated math per se. It's, it's really the culmination of, a, of a, a series of really simple, straightforward concepts, but they kind of build up and they build up in other dimensions and stuff that makes it complicated. So like who here did linear, linear regression, or finding the line of best fit back in school, right? You get the scatter plot, sum of all the points, minimize the error, right? Well, um, that's what a neural network's trying to do in essence. It's trying to look at your data and find that trend but rather than doing it uh, just by trying to define the absolute y equals mx plus b equation to that, it, it takes a different approach. It looks at your scatter plot and trials the line, uh, usually randomly it'll start with the line, and then it'll look at each point one by one. If the line's above, it'll kind of tweak the line up. And if the line's below, it'll kind of tweak the line down. And the more data points you hit, the, the more that line will just kind of move in and move in and move in. And if you have enough data points, it will eventually get really close to that y equals mx plus b without actually solving the equation. Um, and that's what neural nets essentially do. So you, you just keep feeding the data, and it just keeps morphing it until it almost matches that answer. It's a generic function approximator. So you have this curve, you feed it points, and it'll just morph the line, or the plane, or the 8,000 dimensional hyperplane until it fits it like a glove. And uh, playground.tensorflow is actually a really good, um, they have a really good visualization for this. So we have some data points here, and it's going to try to to match the orange and the blue. And that's essentially what it does. And it'll do it for all sorts of different shapes. Um, so what I built was something that collects homebrew recipes, um, cleans them up, stores them, and then pumps those through uh, a neural network, serves up the results on a RESTful API, and then displays it all with this pretty uh, React UI. Um, and the tools I use for that um, to, to actually aggregate the data, a combination of Scrapey and Beautiful Soup, so a spider goes out and looks for things that it recognizes as a beer recipe, and if it finds a page it thinks is a beer recipe, it just saves all that HTML down into a file. And then Beautiful Soup comes through, and Beautiful Soup is good at parsing that HTML, so it'll just break, break the DOM apart in that HTML, 
And you can say, give me everything that looks like a style, give me everything like in list tags, and pump those out as ingredients, stuff like that. Once I have that data out, I just store it in a regular SQLite database, but it's reliable. Um, then from the SQLite database, I, I do some pre-processing and, and give it to TensorFlow and Keras. So TensorFlow is actually doing all the heavy lifting of, of, of building the neural network and stuff. Uh, Keras is this nice, clean, consistent <coughs> interface that sits on top of it. It's really easy to uh, understand and use. So rather than writing this much code to, to build your TensorFlow neural, neural network, you write like this much code. Um, I'm using Python's Eve with the SQL Alchemy plugin. Uh, really simple RESTful interface. You just point it to your database and it makes all the endpoints for you. And then um, most of you probably know about React, just Facebook's, Facebook's face, right? Facebook's front end. All right, so the first step is getting the data. Good data is worth its weights in gold. Um, so actually, building the spider and storing, storing that information was not the hard part. The hard part was actually cleaning the data. And um, it might not come as a surprise. You know, if you're brewing beer, you might be drinking beer. And if you're drinking beer, you might not be accurate <laughs> when you're uh, inputting your data. So um, actually cleaning the data and getting it concise and consistent was, was one of the first initial hurdles that I had to deal with. And there's a number of tools for this. Um, so um, I have uh, this exclusion list, um, this inclusion list, and this containing algorithm. And what it does is um, I, I tell it a bunch of things that it should not regard as ingredients or styles um, or beer and it will remove those from the data set. Um, I tell it things that um, are kind of synonymous. So there's a few different ways to say the same thing. I can tell it that, and it'll, it'll crunch those data points together. Um, and then I combine the whole thing. And um, a lot of this, so these are JSON files. Um, these are actually generated um, from a, a, a Levenstein distance. So Levenstein distance is, is um, the mathematical distance between two words in terms of how many replacements or substitutions or additions you need to get from word A to word B. So uh, to go from like mom to moon, you need to add an O and change an M to an N. So that's a Levenstein distance of two. And um, if you have two things like um, Amarillo hops and Amarillo hops, that's a Levenstein distance of one. They just forgot the R. So with a Levenstein distance of one, I'm pretty confident they meant Amarillo, and I can add that to the list. And I'm not missing that data because they had a typo with one letter. And there's a lot of there's a lot of good Levenstein functions out there. PHP has one built right into it. Um, but a lot of those computations are actually relatively expensive. So uh, doing this in Python was actually crushing my poor, uh, uh, it's a Surface book. I know it's Linux best, but I got penguin socks. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, the first thing I had to contend with was, was uh, actually processing this data and doing it efficiently. And with Python, it was actually taking um, who knows how, how much 7,725 seconds is? It's about 128 minutes, just, just over two hours. Um, so I rewrote my, my parsing and grooming code, code in Go, um, pretty much line for line, function for function. I didn't make any other real improvements on the, the actual code. And Go got it down to three minutes and 40 seconds. So from the time to cook a Thanksgiving turkey to the uh, time to cook a Hot Pocket. And uh, when, you're, when you're working with AI, the faster you can iterate, um, the faster you can, you can get what you want. Um, you found that if you set the, the refresh rate to 60 hertz instead of 59 point whatever, it doesn't do the flashing. 
Okay. If it keeps doing it. Rather than risk it, I think I'll tolerate it until it gets too annoying. Uh, so some stats. This, this is what I came up with um, in terms of groomed, clean recipes. There were a ton that I had to throw out. There's just not, not good data in there. Um, I'm not against throwing out outliers, but just um, data that did not make any sense. Um, so about a quarter million recipes, um, 194 distinct styles, um, not all of them BJCP uh, approved. <laughs> Uh, over 2,000 uh, different fermentables. Um, fermentables, when I say fermentables, I mean like malts or grains, sugars. Um, almost 2,000 hops, about the same number of yeast. Um, since most of you aren't brewers, we might skip the hop quiz. But if one of you want to shout out what you think the most, most common hop was? Cascade, Cascade. Oh yeah. Cascade, Citra, Goldings, Centennial, Amarillo. Alternative facts. What's most commonly used malt? Oh yeah. Second most common. Oh, that's close. Uh, caramel. Crystal 60. Uh, East common denominator. What? What's the most common yeast? Yeah, just regular American. No surprises there. American ale, English ale. California ales actually uh, showed up a lot more than I expected. I thought Belgian or German lager would, would uh, be more prevalent than that. A lot of Californians, I guess. And it's just easier to make ale. Yeah, that, that too. <laughs> but it's easier to drink lager. Um, what about the most common style brewed? IPA. Yeah. So, rhetorically, yeah, of course. What What's the second most common? Uh, uh, the dark one. Uh, good. So I, I put the top ten on here for you. Uh, so American IPA, of course. Uh, pale is is a close second. Wheat beer, Hefeweizens. Uh, specialty beer. So specialty beer has been a bit of a thorn in my side. It is an actual category, and a lot of people put their beer in that category. But um, it's a wide open category, and I think for the purposes of training, training my AI, I might remove it in the future. Um, yeah, and then stout, saisons, browns, bitters, imperial IPAs, Pilsner and Box. All right, so the problem of recipe creation. Um, brewing a good beer is, is, is a combination of, of, you know, precision and calculations and, and making sure you, you're staying on your, your targets, you're hitting your IBUs, your SRMs, your ABVs, um, but uh, there's, there's an amount of intuition to it too, right? Um, guy out at North Fork, he, he actually doesn't really measure anything. He's just been brewing on his system so long that he just feels the heft of the bag, you know, pours in about yay much grain. And, but I won't say his beer is that consistent either. It's consistently good, but it's not consistently consistent. Um, but there's this amount of intuition. And you can have two beers with the same numbers. You know, they'll be quantitatively the same, but they will be qualitatively different. There's there's uh, a lot of nuance in brewing. And that's what really attracted me to having, having AI tackle this problem, because it's, it's, it's what it's perfectly suited for. If you have you know, data and tedium, put an AI on it. Neural network. Um, so to help you kind of understand the problem, I, I put this slide in to just show you uh, coarsely what the brewing process is like. You uh, first add um, grains to uh, some hot water. Um, it's different for different styles of beer. But you want to steep it just like a tea. And that wakes up little enzymes in it that convert the complex carbohydrates into simple sugars that the yeast can eat later. So for that, you need to know uh, what grains you're adding, how much you're adding, and that's really about it. Um, for the second step, you, you take your tea bag out and uh, you go to a boil and add your hops. 
Now for hops, you not only need to know what hops you're adding and how much of those hops you're adding, but timing is a factor now. Because the hops that you add at the start of the boil, if they boil for a full hour, you're just going to get a bunch of bitterness out of those. But if you put the same amount of the same hops in at the end of your boil, with only 10 minutes in the kettle, you won't get as much bitterness out of it, but you'll get a lot of flavor and aroma. So um, you need to know both, or uh, you need to know what hop, what amount, and what time. So you need three pieces of data for the hops. And then for fermentation, you pretty much just need to know the yeast, what, what yeast you're putting in. Um, I'll get into other data points that would be nice to have later. Um, but, all right, so how do I change it to 60 hertz? Go to the desktop, right click, go to display settings. The hertz are hurting. Scroll down. <laughs> Scroll down over here. Advanced. Uh, or display or doctor properties. Monitor. Uh, oh, this is the surface display. Oh, oh. So, so, sorry. Close this. Scroll up. Select the other display. Do the same thing. Sorry, everybody. Monitor. Oh. Try. Maybe try the other one. Try 59. Okay, we're going 59. Wish us luck. I have a beer question. Yes. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. That'd be the way that you make an IPA then? Yeah. That'd be like over That did not work. IPAs um, typically have a lot more hops early in the boil, yeah. Um, because uh, going back to 60, 59 didn't work. Try a different resolution maybe? Um, there's little packets of, of yellow oil in the hops called lupulin, and the longer those see heat, the more they isomerize into the bittering compounds that, that we, we taste. So, um, but the longer they're in the boil, all the really delicate you know, uh, compounds that, that contribute to smell and taste, they boil off and they just kind of go off into the atmosphere. So um, IPAs will typically have a lot of hops throughout the whole boiling period. They'll put a bunch in early, a bunch in the middle, and a bunch so in later. So you don't boil off the, what did you call it, the lupulin? Uh, lupulin. Yeah. Um, all right. So I put a typical recipe on. This is just a stout. Um, I say typical. This is actually a lot better than you'd get out of most recipes. So it has um, the batch size. The batch size is very important because you can have two recipes. And um, if one recipe is for 10 gallons and one recipe is for 5 gallons, Right? You need to normalize it. So you need to take the 10 gallon one and divide it by two so you have the same, same proportions. Um, it has the amount of each grain, which is what we need. For the hops, it has you know, just two ounces of Willamette's um, at 60 minutes, so they see the full boil. And uh, they even did one better, and they gave us the percentage of, of alpha acids, how, how much acid's in the beer. And that's, that's a more reliable way of, of getting the amounts that you need to add. Um, and they also give us additional data on how long to do the mash and what temperature, and how long to ferment and what temperature. And that data is actually surprisingly sparse um, in online home brewing recipes. And I think it's because a lot of sites don't do a good job of, of adding structure around this. People just type it in the preform fields, and so people don't. <laughs> Um, but I think that would help out the AI a lot in terms of identifying different recipes. All right, getting closer. The code. Oh, I know. Uh, so after we get the data and we put it in the database, all clean and has that new data smell, um, we need to start transforming it into something that our, our uh, algorithm can understand. So uh, the first thing we do is we run it through the script called SQL to pickle. <coughs> Who knows what pickle is? Yeah. 
Who knows what pickles are? We should all know what pickles are, but pickle, uh, pickles, pickles, a, 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 an efficient format for, for storing kind of matrix data. So we pull out um, all the SQL data, and we actually have to do some stuff like balancing. So uh, you already saw that like a quarter of all the beer brewed is IPAs. Um, and we don't want this to just be really good at recognizing IPAs, right? We want just as good at recognizing blondes or stouts or ambers. So we actually have to balance out the data that we take out from the database so we have a good representation of each style and each ingredient. So we do some balancing there. Um, no one has seizure issues, right? <laughs> if I fall down. Um, second step. Uh, we take that pickle data and we convert it to one hot. One hot is a common term. Um, so if you have this list of ingredients, like I have this list of colors, red, yellow, green. Come on, no. Um, it, it converts it to this table, so it, it takes this stuff on the y-axis, puts it on the x-axis, and um, just puts a one in the column if it's red, a zero if it's yellow, and it makes the data look a lot bigger. But this is actually really, it's a lot easier for, for the algorithm to understand that because it's gonna take that grid, those ones and zeros, and it'll look at those ones and zeros like peaks and valleys. So you get this topography. And again, it's all about making that generic function approximator. And if you have all these hills and valleys going around, it'll eventually start building them. The landscape that it understands. So, like that mountain range, that's a stout. Um, and then the third thing we do is, um, well, train the model. Um, so we actually we actually take in those those uh, one hot data sets and then uh, the neural network. And this is what it looks like when it runs. You can see we have sixty seven thousand ricks pickled. Um, and those all go in. All right. <clears throat> Not sure if I can show this at Linux Fest. It's a little saucy. But uh, this, this is what uh, my first pass at the uh, model looked like. So um, I was a little naive. I, I was a lot naive. Um, and I actually wrote out separate um, um, miniature neural networks that, that would take in the hops, the malts, and the yeast individually, and then it would take uh, the results from those and smush them together and, and feed that into a, a much deeper one. And it w worked. -ish. You see, like, this 0.4 over here means 40% accuracy. So, not great. But um, across 100 styles, it's, it's actually, I, it was enough to keep me working on it. Um, so, um, this is generated with TensorBoard. It's, it's something that you can plug right on top of a TensorBoard and run a simple uh, command, and it'll actually show you in real time um, how your model is performing, uh, both in terms of accuracy, so how many, how many answers is it getting right? So when it trains, it doesn't give all the data to the algorithm to, to learn from it. It takes a little subset and socks it away, and it never sees that. So it doesn't know the answers. And, and after each run, it'll, it'll show them that data and say, what do you think of this one? Oh, stout, interesting, okay. Well, the IPA, oh, we've got that one right. And it, so it can tell how accurate your model's performing. Um, and then loss typically correlates with it, but not necessarily. Um, your loss function is really important. You wanna, you wanna pick an effective loss uh, program that'll, that'll um, that matches that terrain, that'll, that'll <clears throat> ski down those slopes effectively. So, but don't get intimidated by that. Like, I pretty much tried all the different loss functions until you know, one outperformed the other and just stuck with that. So you don't, you don't need to know all the little details of, of all the little learning parameters. You can just look at the documents and say, well, let's try SGD, let's try Atom. Oh, well, Gradient Descent did better, so We'll, we'll stick with that. All right.
So, let's, let's actually do it. Um, so, I want to give a shout out to this guy, because uh, he actually kind of got me started in it. This is Siraj, Siraj Raval, um, and this is him explaining a, a GAN by making Pokemon. <laughs> um, so the three things I ultimately want out of my AI is one, um, ingredient ad libs. So I want to be able to look in my fridge and say, oh, I have a pound of this and an ounce of that. Like, how do I make a good IPA? And it'll, it'll fill in the blanks for me. Or, or tell me you just can't. Like, that's, no. Um, <laughs> um, I also wanted to give design suggestions. So if you have a recipe that you think is a good IPA, it can look at it and say, well, maybe, but you could probably tone back, you know, those, those late edition hops a little bit. It's, it's not really what most people do with IPAs. So be able to give that kind of feedback. And then ultimately, if it doesn't do this yet, I wanted to do novel recipe synthesis. So to be able to just say, I want a stout. I want a Belgian pale ale. And it will generate from the ground up the entire recipe. So right now it's half of that. To get that, you need this, a generative adversarial network, which sounds like something out of Terminator, right? <laughs> uh, and what I have is the left half of that. It's called a discriminatory network, uh, which sounds like something out of, no, not touching it. Um, so a discriminatory network will give you uh, the probability of x given y. Um, a generative network will give you the probability of X and Y. So a discriminatory network's really good at looking at a recipe and saying, like, I know stouts, that's a stout. Generative network is, is really good at saying, uh, I think this is a stout. Like, it feels stoutish enough. Like, but it can generate a stout recipe, so it'll pass that over to the discriminatory network, and they'll say, no, 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 bro, not stout. And then it'll learn. Try again. Yeah, it's getting there. Learn. Try again. Okay, you know that I I drink that, and they they build up until it's able to generate a stout. Okay, um, so let's run it before I get to this point. Um, do I have it up? And is it running? Yes. Is it all running? No. Okay. So, um, made a nice little batch script for it. Just type in the art of pour, tap. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to spawn off two shells. One of them is going to start up that API, that Python Eve SQL Alchemy API. Um, and that's going to be in a Conda environment that has TensorFlow and all sorts of other stuff installed for it. Um, and then the other shell is just going to run npm start on the React front end. And it might take a minute here, but once it's done, we'll have localhost 3000, the best localhost. And we'll be able to play with it. While this fires up, does anyone have any questions in the meantime? Too late. <laughs> um, so this is it. And mind you, I do not have a lot of UI UX experience. I, I try to get by, but um, this is it. So a few things I want to explain. Um, the, the shape of this matters, right? So you have to make a decision at some point. How many hops am I going to allow in a recipe? How many malts am I going to allow in a recipe? And so you have to look at your data and say, well, if I limit them to 10 hops, uh, how, how, how much data does that get me? If I open it up to 100, you know, get them all. Um, so you want to find that sweet spot where you give them just enough to get the bulk of your data. Um, but the more you add, um, the harder it's going to be on your AI. Um, so I, I only work with recipes that have a yeast, 
up to five different grains and up to uh, looks like nine hops. And that's after a lot of trial and error, just about, you know, I get. And typically, I find the quality of recipes kind of goes down as you can tell people are just trying to add whatever they have uh, and make a beer when you have like 20 hops and 20 malts. Um, okay, so um, let's, let's make a beer. Um, let's start off with something classic. We'll do an American ale yeast. We'll, of course, have two row, what do we think, like 10 pounds? This is for a five gallon batch. Um, and then that second most common one, caramel 60, we'll, we'll just put a pound of that in. And then we'll add some cascades, do two ounces right at the start of the boil. We'll add some Chinooks, one ounce, 30 minutes in. Um, let's put in some, ooh, I like mosaics. Mosaics give you a nice like grapefruit flavor, citrus flavor at the end, so we'll put in an ounce of that at 10 minutes, and then let's do citra. Citra is kind of the same deal. So this will be a little piney, little little earthy, but mostly citrus on the back end, and we'll add those at zero right at the end of the boil. So hit test. Um, that pings the API. These are those big arrays of one hot data. Um, and we get this sweet, sweet response um, that classifies this beer as right on the cusp. It's mostly IPA, a little bit. You could call it a pale. Uh, next closest, 13.3% maybe Imperial IPA. So um, you get the response and then, and then you, you, uh, you break down the, the weight that it gives each, each um, category. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see, what if we added some roasted barley, because everyone loves like a good uh, coffee <laughs> IPA, some black patent, same idea, and some chocolate. Now what's it going to think? I hear some homebrewers laughing. <laughs> Well, there's a malt called chocolate malt. So we see it's way less certain about it being an IPA now. Um, and it's kind of drifting into amber. Um, and if I, let's say, went to like an English ale yeast, I bet if I bop, bump the hops down, OK. Let's get rid of Citra. Sorry, Citra. Um, instead of mosaics, let's let's use Fuggles, like a nice uh, classic English style. And let's see where where it takes that. Okay, now. Uh, because the hop profile is so different now, it um, doesn't think it's an IPA at all, and it'd be right, an American IPA at least. Um, and it's, it's leaning more into to porter, which, which would be more right. Bitter it might be off on. Um, I was trying to get it to stout, but I think it's well past stout with, with all of these dark grains. So yeah, um, I do generate recipes with this. But I don't use it use the generative adversarial network like I described earlier for that. What I do is I use this rogue loop where um, I, I pick a style, randomize the selections, and then run it. And uh, I run it with a few different variations, and then I pick the most performant of those. Start that as my next seed, randomize it, pick the next until it gets to, to a confidence threshold for one specific style. So I just put in junk. It's like, I'm 1% sure that's a stout. Run it again with 10 different variations. It's like, well, this one's 2% sure now. So I start with that, randomize it. Three, four, five. Let it run overnight and 
A couple blue screens later, you got <laughs> a stout recipe. <laughs> Save your data between each run. <laughs> uh, <laughs> lessons learned the hard way. Uh, yeah. Challenges. Always challenges. Um, challenges in the data. So uh, stylistic overlap. Um, there are a number of beers that you could call a pale and call an IPA and be right. You know, there's, there's just overlap between the two. So if you don't have two globs of data that are necessarily linearly separable, you can't draw a line or a plane, you can't cut them apart in any sensible way they're entangled, you know, how can you ever be sure that it's an IPA or a pale? So that, that's been a challenge. Um, mislabeling. I thought this would be a bigger issue because, again, people drink and when you drink, you just get interesting data. You get noise, Gaussian noise in your uh, data. Uh, so uh, I called this a non, an existential non-issue. So what I did was I, I looked up all the uh, quantitative data around each style, what, what numbers, you know, essentially, a, a beer would have to, to be in for those ranges to be called a red called a blonde, called an IPA, and I cross-referenced all of my data with that. And it took out a ton of stuff. It's like, they called this an IPA, but it's like two points too bitter and, and three points too, too light in color to be called an IPA. So I threw it out. Ran it again, got the same exact results. So uh, if people are putting in um, bad data, they're at least doing it evenly across the board. <laughs> um, <laughs> or balances out, um, but I still, I still run that filter every now and then just to make sure like that assumption still holds true. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, temperature and procedural data, getting, getting you know, what mash temp, what fermentation temperature, getting that consistent, that'd be a huge help as another data point. Iterating, you know, when you brew a beer, it takes weeks to months. Um, so being able to get feedback and put that into the AI to improve it is not something very feasible for one person. But if you have a community, then we can generate a lot more data and improve faster. The future. Who likes the future? It's OK. You can tell me. We're safe here. Hopefully, hopefully I can brighten that. Uh, some of this stuff is, is already being done. Some of this, uh, Brian up at Western, some of his undergrads are doing some of this work. Um, and I think this is one of them. Scheduling optimization. So you have to, you know, as a brewer, you have tens or hundreds of different vessels that you need to juggle around for your mash and your boil and to ferment. And the fermentation takes different times for different styles. And you have to put in a bright tank. And it might be sits there for two weeks. And then you have to figure out how to reconcile that with supply and demand. That's hard for a person, right? Even with a beer. So um, AI is, is proving handy in that. Um, infection detection. So uh, the earlier you can detect a, a, your beer's been compromised, the sooner you can, can dump it, clean it, get a new beer in there, and, and make money. Time is money. So that's important, too. And you know when you put things under the microscope and you run them through, through chemical analysis, you know, there might be signals so faint that a person wouldn't ke catch it, but with enough data, uh, an algorithm can, you know, days, weeks ahead. Um, I'm so sorry about this. <laughs> Come on. Trying to even remember what the slide is. So uh, macro brewing mediocrity. Um, there's something to be said about, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, not only being able to, to uh, interrogate a data set and ask where the trend is and, and what's a good beer, but being able to interrogate a data set and say, what's the most, the most profitable, least interesting beer that I can get out of here. And um, I, I foresee some of that. Um, brewing IoT. 
Um, there's tons of smart devices uh, actually coming onto the, the brewing market. Um, a lot of them in Kickstarter kind of phases right now. Um, so just having real um, impartial data streaming in uh, will be a boon and really help lay the foundation. Um, AI-driven design. So um, that's kind of what I showed today with, with TAP. Um, just being able to have an AI um, consult you on your beer. Um, and then the thing I'm personally the most excited about is evolutionary styles. So m pretty much all of the styles of beer that you see and recognize today are historically derived. They're because, you know, uh, this place up in England had, you know, a lot of uh, uh, minerals in their water. So to get their pH right, they had to add uh, roasty malts. And so all of a sudden, stouts, porters, I want to start from, from first principles and just make a light beer and make a dark beer. Don't give it a name or maybe name it like Gerald Rutherford, <laughs> um, but be style agnostic and then just iterate over what people like. So let them try the beer, get feedback, change the beer. Um, and what I'm hoping will happen is, you know, eventually I'll get enough people trying that light beer and enough people saying I want it to be hoppier, enough people saying I want it to be maltier get enough of that, they will have a bifurcation, and not have a hoppy light beer, you know, maybe Reginald, and a malty light beer, and then I'll do it again, and again, and again, until I hit these leaf nodes, right, where people are just kind of happy with the beer, they don't want to see it change, and then I, I am confident there's whole new styles of beer that haven't been discovered, and we might not find them any other way, until, you know, dumb luck as homebrewers. Um, and then I just wanted to speak to beer as, as a combination of an art and a science. You know, it's, you can't overstate that intuition and that creativity, you know. I'm not looking to make an AI that's going to replace us as homebrewers. I'm looking to make an AI that's going to augment us as homebrewers and make us more effective and let us to do what we do best, you know, is use our imagination and come up with, with what we think and what we like, um, what suits our palates and let the AI do all, all the heavy lifting. Um, the code, you can look at the code, you can clone the code, you can change the code, you can push up pull requests, I wouldn't mind. There's a lot of to-dos in there. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's an account, the art of pour, github.com, if you can catch it between the flickers. <laughs> um, there's three projects, they're all prefaced with TAOP dash. Um, so the AI, the API, and the UI are all in separate projects, repos. Um, and that's, that's the North Fork Brewing where he doesn't measure anything, he just <laughs> pours the sacks in. Um, yes? technical question. You were talking about missing data, like missing the temperature or mm -hmm. missing some nugget of the recipe. How did you handle that missing data? In the so I didn't. And I think my accuracy hurts because of it. Um, there, it was just so sparse and inconsistent because uh, the recipes that did have it, it tended to be in a free form notes field. So who knows how they wrote it. Um, it's easy enough to recognize, you know, a number and, and then a, a capital F or, you know, it's easy enough to extract those. And the ranges for fermentation and, and mash are so different, it's easy to differentiate them, even without surrounding context. Um, but there just wasn't enough of it um, to really use. You used that where it was available and you just ignored it when it wasn't? I didn't. Um, and maybe that's something that, that people are, are better versed with this could, could consult me on. But I was under the impression that if I didn't have it for everything, it's probably best not to use it for anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you trained on any of the uh, like social beer review data on sites like Untapped or anything? Ah, thank you. I did want to say something about that. Oh, Untapped, that'd be a good idea. Because they do home brew beer too now. Um, no, uh, that would also be a boon to have uh, ratings, feedback on the beer and be able to factor that in. Because right now I'm just going off my complete blind faith on the homebrewing community to consistently make good beer. So I can't really take um, 
this IPA and this IPA and say this one's better. If I could, if there was a rating system that I could reliably pull from, but there isn't a consistent and reliable one across, and even the ones that do, they have so few reviews or no reviews at all that um, it's, it's just a, another, another missing spot. But if I could have that, I could bias certain recipes over others so they'd have more weight. And when you're trying to nudge that line over, you could nudge it a little more for those beers. Um, I do do a little of that because I know there are some good sources. There's sources that are better than others, so I put a bias vector in that, that gives them a little more oomph. Yeah. Hi. I have two questions about your data. Yeah. Uh, so your main network acts as a classifier for recipes given into it, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, do you check your data to see if you have like equal portions of all your classifiers? I do. I balance. I balance it out um, because otherwise, it just call everything an IPA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, did you like have like a reserve of data that you know the answers to? Yep. Any fractions?